give Jesus a shout of praise. That was good for the saints if they were losing. Come on, let's give Jesus a shout of praise, somebody. Come on. Yes. He's the one that saved us, delivers us, heals us. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our God, our best friend. As uh, the Apostle Paul said, I live and have and move my, my, have my being. I live, move, and have my being in him. He says, no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. It's a place of knowing that Jesus Christ has forgiven us, washed us, cleansed us, transformed us. Can somebody say amen? Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We ask you, Lord, to bless the word, to bless the service. Lord, let your Holy Spirit fill this place today. Lord, anoint the worship team. Let your name be glorified. Let your name be praised. Let your name be magnified. Father, it is a privilege to be in your house. It is a privilege to know you. It is a privilege to serve you. Father, we speak wholeness in this house, healing in this house. We speak salvation in this house. We speak peace in this house. We speak the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on, who's ready to worship the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? Come on, sinuses are taking over, so I'm going to need a little help this morning. sorrows there is an ocean deeper than fear the tide is rising rising there is a current stirring deep inside it's overflowing from the heart of god the flood of heaven crashing over us the tide is rising rising oh bursting bursting up from the ground we feel it now We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. There is a river where goodness flows. There is a fountain that drowns sorrows. There is an ocean, but deeper than fear, the tide is rising, rising. There is a current stirring deep inside. It's overflowing. From the heart of God, the flood of heaven crashing over us, the tide is rising, rising. Bursting, bursting up from the ground, we feel it now. Bursting, bursting up from the ground, we feel it now. We come alive in the river, we come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. Come on, tell him. We come alive in the river. 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 Break open prison doors. Set all the captives free. Spring up a well. Spring up a well, spring up a well in me. Nothing can stop this joy. We're dancing in the streets. Spring up a well, spring up a well, spring up a well in me. Break open prison doors. Set all the captives free. Spring up a well. Spring up a well, spring up a well in me. Nothing can stop this joy. We're dancing in the streets. Spring up a well, spring up a well, spring up a well in me. We come alive in the river. 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 We 
come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the river. Break open prison doors. Set all the captives free. Spring up a well. Spring up a well. Spring up a well in me. Come on, let's declare. Nothing can stop this joy. We're dancing in the streets. Spring up a well. Spring up a well. Spring up a well in me. Break open prison doors. Set all the captives free. Spring up a well. Spring up a well. Spring up a well in me. Nothing can stop this joy. We're dancing in the streets. Spring up a well. Spring up a well. Spring up a well in me. We come alive in the river. 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 Isn't he worthy of our praise? Come on, give him the biggest shout you can. You're holy, God. You're worthy, God. You make it all possible. Come on, tell him. We will stand and rejoice. Oh, as one people, lifting one voice. You're worthy of glory, worthy of honor, and worthy of praise. Will shout and proclaim the greatness of your holy name. You're worthy of glory, worthy of honor, and worthy of praise. You are holy. You are holy. The whole earth sings your praise. The whole earth sings your praise. You are holy. You are holy, the whole earth sings your praise, the whole earth sings your praise. Now of your goodness we will sing, ooh, hallelujah to the King. You're worthy of glory, worthy of honor, and worthy of the praise. I'm now redeemed from my past. Your people dance cause we're free at last. You're worthy of glory, worthy of honor, and worthy of praise. You are holy. You are holy. The whole earth sings your praise. The whole earth sings your praise. You are holy. You are holy. The whole world sings your praise. We sing your praise. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of our best for you. We pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. Come on, let's worship. We pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. And we pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. We 
pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. Come on, pour out your best. We pour out our best for you. 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 You are holy. You are holy. The whole earth sings your praise. The whole earth sings your praise. We pour out our best for you. 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 Oh, we pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. We pour out our best for you. Come on, lift up a shout. You were. Come on. You are holy. Come on, tell him who yes, he is. You are, you are holy. If you know him, talk to him right now. The whole earth sings your praise. Jesus, you're worthy. The whole earth sings your praise. Lord, let the whole earth sing your praise. You are holy. Come on, yes, sing you it. are. And you are holy. Jesus, Jesus. The whole earth sings your praise. Come on, come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. You may be seated for just a few minutes. I know we're changing the order of things up just a little bit because uh, uh, we have some special things going on this morning. As a matter of fact, you can see my t-shirt. It says Nihilus, our favorite pastor. So we wore that. Uh, she is going to be dedicated this morning in just a little while, and we're excited about that. But, uh, yeah, come on. Um, we're going to get uh, do the dedication, the announcements and things right now, and uh, then we're going to go right back into some slower worship and just get a hold of God, and uh, then we'll see what the Lord does for the rest of the service. But I am excited. A couple of things I want to bring out is Christianity 101. Can you... Just for the sake of humoring me, can you say Christianity 101? This is a, a biblical foundation uh, for new Christians or for old Christians. Some Christians have never really grabbed a hold of why they believe what they believe. They just know their sins are forgiven and they go to church. Come on. And so this takes you through a journey of learning just in six weeks what just happened to you. We just finished bringing the majority of our church through this, um, coming up on the 19th of November. Everyone say the 19th of November. We will be giving out a, a graduation certificates that Sunday morning for all that have completed this. So. And I know some have missed some classes and things like that. If you have, go through it, get it done, and get, get to Sister Tammy, send her a picture or something so that we know to put your name on the list that you have completed this book. And here's our goal in this. 
is that when somebody gives their life to Jesus in a church, we don't just want them to get baptized or, you know, shake a hand and start coming to church only. We want them to know God's Word. And so each person that has gone through this is now a teacher of this. And then we're going to develop a couple of teams so that if somebody get, gives their life to the Lord, they'll be invited to receive this book and and learn about the Lord from the foundation up. So it's very powerful. We're excited about this. And if you have not uh, even gotten one of these books or come to any of the classes but would like to, I've been saved for 50, I think, three years or so. And I'm going to tell you something. This book is just so exciting to me. So it's not like you're going to read some old material. This is well written and it's very stirring. So if you'd like to get one of these books, um, Sister Tammy, raise your hand if you would. This is my wife, Sister Tammy. Please let her know uh, before service is over, at the end of service, so that we, we're going to make another order for uh, quite a few of these books. But we want to make sure that if you want one, you can get it and go through it. Uh, the one lady, she says, I went through that whole book in two weeks. She got so excited. So this is powerful. That's a foundation. And then after that, we're going to bring as many as are interested and willing and hungry into 201, which is another level of learning God's Word. Our goal is that this house will not only be a house where the Spirit of God moves, and not only be a house where people give their life to the Lord, but where people are trained and taught in the foundations of God's Word that they can carry it outside and stand and know what they believe and why they believe it. Can somebody give the Lord a praise on that? Secondly, every year one of our major outreaches is Toys for Tots. Um, how many in here can raise your hand and say you've been affected by the Toys for Tots program sometime in your life? Come on. Many have. Uh, our church has hosted Toys for Tots for the last, uh, I would say, 40, 40 years, uh, helping children with Christmas. And we've become a Toys for Tots uh, uh I guess they sponsor us, we sponsor them, however you want to do it. We're a, what, what's it called, Amy? Help me. We're, we're an official Toys for Tots organization. Thank you. Shoot. These, these words are tough hanging on to them. Here's what we do for those that want to know. We start out with fundraisers, over 100 boxes out into the community to collect toys. Um, while that's going on, we have a, a building that we borrow and we set up tables and we create a distribution center that has toys for every age of children, okay? And we stack those tables full, and then they go shop and buy more. They empty the boxes and fill that thing up. While that is going on, we then start our interviews in here for the families, the recipients. They come in the week of Thanksgiving or the week after Thanksgiving, I think it is. It's, the dates are on the, uh, the bulletins. We... Uh, interview each family that is looking for help we make sure their children are legit and all that stuff and then we pray for them if they want and we schedule them for a day of orientation and that day they'll come into back to the church and they'll be instructed and given a voucher uh, and then after the orientation we'll stamp their voucher and they're scheduled to go to the distribution center and shop for themselves but after the announcements are made, we'll put on a Christmas program. We've done this every year. We've done uh, the Grinch that stole Christmas. This whole wall was, I mean, the scenes were incredible. So we've done some major drama presentations, and we give an invitation for prayer at the end of every one of those. There'll be about 1,000 people come through in four days that will receive the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this brings us all the way through December, and this is a major event that we do. Uh, we've had s uh, hundreds and thousands of people that have been touched and saved, and many have uh, you know, become leaders in the church and so forth and so on. So we want to invite you to be a part of that. Also, this year's program, because we've had some events that have happened that have kind of spiraled us into a uh, uh, delayed mode of getting our drama together, we just finally started our practices, and if you can tell, this is November, so we're out of time. So here's going to be the program this year. We're going to have a Christmas scene set up over here with the family, 
And the child is going to ask the mother, Mother, what's the true meaning of Christmas? On this left side is going to be a mass choir of people that are going to sing. And we're going to go through about four or five Christmas songs. And we're going to break it up. In between the songs, one person will step forward. We're going to start with a child. And they're going to read a little paragraph of the story of Christmas uh, from the Bible that people can understand. And they'll step back in the choir, they'll sing, and then someone else will come up. I'm going to have Caden's going to come up. Can I tell him what you're going to do? Caden's going to come up with the guitar and sit down. We'll just spotlight him. and He'll, he'll lead it with the guitar, and that's unusual for him. You know, that's a brand new thing. And then the choir will come in. Caleb's got a song he's going to sing very powerful at the end. The choir will come in. And we're going to add some features in there that would be a blessing. I'd like to get some horns or something like that. Anything we can do to just ramp it up to another level, but we're going to give the Christmas program just with a, 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 a song of a choir and a story of the Bible being read, give an invitation for people to give their life to Jesus. And I'm going to say this and I'll, I'll shift on the subject. Last year, the year before, we had an incident happen right at the end of our program. We're giving, getting ready to pray for people, give an invitation, and a little boy over here has a seizure and a, a, a bad one. And so it ended up they had to call an ambulance in. Everybody's faces were looking that way. It was a real, real tough thing. We prayed for him. He, he's, he was all right, but he left. The lights are on. People are all distracted. And I asked the Lord, I said, should I dismiss or give an invitation for people to give their life to you? He spoke so clear to me. He says, this is mine. This is what I do. You give the invitation and I'll bring the people. So I did. Can I tell you something? That altar call was incredible. We gave an invitation as literally they just came out of the seats in droves, not because the boy had a seizure, because they knew he was fine, but because God by the Spirit was dealing with people. And that's what we're in this for, is to minister. All the gifts and stuff are temporary, guys. Everybody knows that. But there's one gift that's permanent, and that's called eternal life. Can somebody say amen to that? So if you'd like to be, help us with this and be a part of it, the, the invitation is open. We need bodies that want to sing to come. It's pretty simple. Our next practice is this Thursday coming up at 6 p.m. It's from 6 to 7. We're going to try to do it one hour. And then another practice on Saturday at 6 p.m. So we've only got just about three weeks before we got to put it on. So we need all the help we can get. And if you can't sing real well, but you can make a noise, come up. We need you. We need you to do that before the Lord. Amen. And last but not least, this Thursday, no, Wednesday, the 15th, we're having a church family uh, Thanksgiving dinner. We'd love for every one of you to come and join us. Sister Tammy, wave your hand, please. This is my lovely wife. She needs help organizing this thing. And then we also need people to bring food. Everyone say, bring food. <laughs> You can get with her on what to bring or however that works. But uh, there's been a few times where the food was a little short and we were a little scared. So we went to Logan's and ordered a whole bunch of chicken. Tim? There's, there's a list on the back, the orange paper. Write what you can bring. She'll go over it and that'll tell us what we need to call people and say, hey, we need some rolls or we need some you know, whatever, turkey or what have you. So we have a wonderful time, though. It's just a good family. And we're also going to have communion that day and, and share the Lord's Supper at the same time. So please plan uh, this, this Wednesday to join us. And that would be uh, time, Tim, 7 p.m. Amen. So if you can help us set up tables, if you can help us get food, you can help us clean up. But she needs all the help she can get in organizing that. Amen. Now it is time to give to the Lord. Come on. I'm going to say this. Pastor Marcus is going to come and share, but I'm going to say this real quick. In the church, there's this thing called tithing. How many have ever heard about that? And there's people out there that say it's not for today. I want you to know something. I'm going to give you a quick rundown. 
Before the law ever came into existence, the Ten Commandments, before any of that existed, there was this guy named Abraham. And Abraham got blessed. And he gave a tithe to the priest on that day and said, I just want to bless you with a tithe, the tenth of what, I, what God blessed me with. And then when the law came, the law required men and women to give God a tenth. And then when the law was fulfilled, now we step into the place of the blessing of the Lord. So when we give our tithe, I don't believe God's going to curse you if you don't tithe. I just don't agree with that because I'm not under the curse. But I will say this, he cannot bless you. Come on. So when we give of our tithe, we're stepping into the realm of God's blessing that he says, you give and I'll give back to you. Good measure, shaken together, pressed down. You won't be able to hold the blessing. And there are many Christians that live in that place and walk in those blessings. And there are many that don't and don't see it. So it's a revelation we've been trying to get you to catch. Come on, Pastor Marcus, if you would. Give him a big hand, our youth pastor for over 25 years. Hallelujah. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to add to that, Pastor. You got it covered. I, I love it. But hey, good morning, family. Can I tell you, I'm up here playing, and I'm looking out there, and look, just to me, look at somebody next to you and say, hey. Just tell them, say, hey. Look at somebody say, hey. You look good today. Yeah. Because from my vantage point, you do. You look outstanding. I, my heart was racing up. I was so excited to see all of you today. And I know that probably sounds weird to you, but as a pastor, listen, I told Chris this earlier. I said, our church is huge. I honestly think our church is bigger than every church in town. I really do. That's not a prophetic statement. That's an actual statement. Most of our members are in other churches. They're all over the place. And we're okay with that, right? Because we're the family of God, amen? So if you've got every church in Picky, you'll find somebody that either started in here and moved in here, and I'm like, Go where you grow. That's what I'm talking about. But that being said, seeing you in this building is so exciting. It's so exciting. And I love you for it. I really do. I'm excited to see all of you today. God bless you. I'm not going to add anything to what Pastor said. I think he covered the tithe thing. But I, I encourage you to do that. I, ch I challenged God on that years ago and uh, tried to prove him wrong. And uh, here I am now, uh, over 30 years later, and uh, he, I haven't been able to do it yet. So he still comes through and does exactly what he says he's going to do. So, so pray on it. And uh, once again, I don't look at what people give. I don't want to know. That's between you and Jesus. Amen? So what you give is up to you. But I, I, I like having a place where we can come together. And uh, so do what God tells you to do. Amen? Be good? All right. I'm going to shut up and get out of the way. We've done it. we got other things to handle this morning. If you got an offering today, if you don't have anything, I'm going to encourage you to do this. Lift it up before the king. If you got an empty hand like myself, that's fine too. Let's lift it up right now. Let's just honor the king. Father, we lift these gifts before you right now. Lord, you see each and every one. Lord, we thank you for what you've provided. We thank you for what you're going to provide. And Lord, I ask that you bless the offering to meet the needs of this house, Lord God. And I pray that in turn you'd bless each and every one that is giving today according to your word and your will and your purpose. I ask in the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. If you believe what we pray, why don't you shout amen. The Bible says we're to be cheerful givers. It's now time to give the offering. I didn't hear everybody. It's now time to give the offering. Brother Curtis just said, you know, when you said that about Abraham, he said, you know why Abraham gave? And he said, because he knew where it came from. How many know where your, how many know where your blessing and your finances come from? Woo! Come on, give the Lord the biggest shout that you can. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where are you at, Shauna? Pastor Marcus, come up here if you would. Sean is that I heard a voice oh there she is you stand down there 
Here, Shauna, I'll give you this. Yeah, in a minute. speechless thank you I just you know I, we, when we do pastor appreciation I just think about him I don't think about me and I just I thank you I, it, it means something it does I didn't think it would but it does it's cool thank you so uh, y'all got a million dollars in here that'd be great no, no I'm just kidding I love you all thank you hallelujah go ahead I'm I've uh I've been looking for my Harley for the last 40 years Robert they've never but you know they gave me one one year it was this big you know Hey, Miss Tammy said, keep looking. Thank you uh, for giving today, and amen. Thank you, guys. Hallelujah. Um, this morning, we're going to do a, a, a wonderful baby dedication. Um, yeah, we, we kind of decided, who do we bring up here for this thing? And uh, because I think the whole church owns her. Uh, and and uh, so it's kind of crazy, but... Uh, Renee, would you want to bring that baby up there? Oliver is going to come and stand as a, a godparent beside her and any of the other family members that are here that would like to come and stand up here with them. You're welcome uh, to come this morning. So you'll just stand. Come on. Come on in the middle, guys, over here. Yeah. You, you, stand, you can stand right there. It looks better this direction. Yeah, beautiful baby. That, that little child... She has captured the hearts of most of this house. Uh, I, I, was, I was saying, I, you know, you never know who's going to be holding this, this child. And, and they don't let her go. They, they kind of just uh, uh, have a, uh, unofficially adopted her. If they got her, they keep her. And, and she likes me, but she's tired, I think, today. She looks like she's got a little bit of that sleepiness on her. But Renee, we're, we're proud of, of you. And, of course, uh, uh, you know, our loss with Jaden, you know, it's, it, our hearts hurt. And, um, but he's alive. And, and this baby is alive uh, through him and from him. And what a beautiful gift that this world has in Nyla Elizabeth Morales. Come on, give the Lord a hand. So I want to speak to the family, Renee, to you guys, and to the church all at the same time um, about baby dedication. In the book of Matthew, chapter 19, it says, uh, and Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. God had a thing for kids. Uh, he did. He he loved them, and he said because uh, uh, they they are a a symbol of what Christianity really is. And then the second scripture I want to bring this morning is Proverbs twenty two six, and this is the big one. It says, "Train up a child in the way he should go, or she, and when hi baby, <laughs> when he or she is old, they will not depart from it." And uh, I'm a holder. Is that all right? Well, if she doesn't, can, can I hold you? Is that all right? Come on. Uh-oh. Help me get her up here. There we go. Not sure where my hand is. There we go. Okay. She just smiles. She'll stare at me and just smile so big sometimes. And uh, But since she does it to everybody, but I think I'm the special one. And that's why that's why I got a, uh, uh-huh. That's why I got a uh, um, uh, T-shirt that says I'm her favorite pastor. But it says, uh, train up a child in the way she is, uh, uh, train up a child in the way she should go, and when she is old, she will not depart from it. I'll say it that way. Um, this is uh, the, the building foundation of her life. Uh, somewhere I read years ago that the first six years of a child's life are some of the most important because it develops them. And if, if they're not developed right, there can be a lot of issues that have to be dealt with. But so the, the, I wrote down 10 areas to build foundation in, in uh, her life. And this comes, 
It can come from TV if you want it to. It can come from the internet if you want it to. You got my glasses? I think I'm in trouble. Oh, you got the speaker there. Oh, the mic. Here we go. We'll, we'll swap. I'm sorry, baby. I forgot I had this microphone. She's wanting to grab that thing. Sorry, I'll get you back in a minute. <laughs> oh, she does too. Anyway, when, when we do our job and we don't rely on TV and all them other things to do it, we'll teach her, Renee, and this is what, what you guys and your family will do and others will do, is teach her her morals. The morals come from the family foundation. The standards of life come from your training and your teaching. Her confidence, this is a big word, her confidence will come from the family. Um, the directions that she takes in life will come from your directions, your, your words. Um, the decisions that she makes, which can transform a world, it can change everything. Those decisions are built on the foundations that have been installed inside their life. And then we go to the spiritual, her walk with God. It's going to be, as Pastor Marcus says, your example and the examples of others in the family. How you walk with God, you're going to show her how to walk with God. Um, your knowledge of the scriptures, her knowledge of the scriptures, Renee, is going to come straight from you. It's, you're going to put that in. Don't rely on the church to teach her how to live the word. It comes from you. How to walk in the agape love, the love of God, that comes from you and from the family. As you walk in agape love and live it, she'll experience it. And then last but not least is she'll learn how to uh, understand the power of the Holy Spirit. How many know you can't be saved unless the Holy Spirit comes and gets you? He's, he's the one that, that pulls you in. And he becomes the best friend. I was talking with my brother yesterday that we call it the fruit of the Spirit. How many has ever heard that expression, the fruit of the Spirit? It's the Spirit's fruit, not ours, it's His. Uh, the gifts of the Spirit. So it's the Spirit of God that brings us to Christ that's here and in our salvation. So in the Scripture, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. This is your job to train her and take it serious. It's, this is the greatest gift in the world, to be given a child that you can just pour into in how they should live. Can somebody say amen? amen. The book of Proverbs chapter 18. Now I'm going to quote it the way the scripture says it. You ready? The power of death and life is in the tongue. You see, we quote it, the power of life and death. How many ever heard it said that way? But we flipped it around. The truth is the power of death and life is in the tongue because I believe it's written that way to let you know death is powerful and you've got to push it off and reverse that thing. Somebody say amen. So your ability to speak into her life, life and not death. And I'm going to uh, uh, be a dad and a grandpa for a minute. We must be careful of the words that we speak to our children. The slangs or the things when we're frustrated, be very careful because this is a beautiful gift from God. I told them, I said, I said, this baby, when she was born, she doesn't end up being a prophetess. I don't know what she's going to be because she stares right through people. How many can agree with that? I mean, she'll stare right slap through you, and she does. It's very powerful. In Psalms 139, you can read it if you'd like, but it says this, referring to God and the things of our life. It says, when she was in the womb, before she was born, God was shaping her. You can read it in Psalms 139. And then he, then he puts in there, even before the child came forth, the books of their life were written. And if you study the word books in the Hebrew, you'll find it means the prophecies from God about her life were written while she was in the womb. Come on. That means there is, Renee, a divine destiny for this beautiful child. So knowing that, I'm going to ask you some questions. And Oliver, as a godparent, you can agree uh, with this. If you don't, she will hurt you, I know. So here's the question I have, Renee. Before God and this company of family and friends, do you vow to be the Christian example God has called you to be for this baby? Do you promise to teach her godly principles and standards? Do you promise to speak life and encourage her as a winner in her life? Do you promise to pray for her daily 
and to push her towards the divine destiny that God's already set in order? Do you promise to build her a strong foundation? Amen. Family, do you agree with that? Now I'm going to turn this way. Come on. If you are willing to help us do this, stand to your feet. Come on. And if you can't stand, it's all right. Some of you know her, some of you don't, it's all right. But I want you just to agree with me as I read this to you. Church family, because you guys have all adopted her, and Renee. I mean, this is, this is like we are all one family. I don't know how you, you know, invite the family, but there'll be like 100 people up here. Do you promise to be the Christian example God has called you to be to help our children, and especially this baby, be raised? Do you promise to take uh, or to teach her godly principles and standards? Do you promise to speak life and encourage her as a winner in her life? Do you promise to pray daily for her divine destiny? And do you promise to build her as best you can a strong foundation? Come on. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. We're going to pray for her. Did you want to lead a prayer over her or not? It's up to you. You're good? Okay. Come on, baby girl. Sorry. Now you can come back and come on. We'll come back. Come on, Pastor Marcus. If you would. We're going to see see how you're doing. You want to try to grab this thing? I know you are. There we go. Get some oil there, Marcus. We're going to oil her up. Come on, church. Stretch your hands towards her. Yeah, that's fine. Just put a little dab on her. A little dab will do it. Come on, church. Stretch your hand towards us. Father. We pray over Nyla today. We thank you for the gift that she has got. We thank you, Lord, for, for all that she represents. Lord, that out of her life, we declare there will be joy, there will be peace, and that she will be an influence that will touch thousands of people. Lord, we declare, Lord Jesus, that your spirit is on her and in her, and that you will do a great thing in her life. And that you will call her, Lord, even to speak your word to those that are around. And that will listen. And you will anoint her. And Father, I pray for Renee. In Jesus' name, we cover her. That you will use her. And Lord, as a mother, I've seen the words that you've given her. I see her stand in the toughest trials. And Lord, you've carried her all the way through. And now this beautiful child, Lord, is coming up, not only taught by her, but her family and spiritual family. So we lift Renee up, God, and we pray to give her the wisdom of a godly mother. Anoint her feet and the direction of her steps, Lord. The Bible says that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We cover her, Lord, right now as a church family and as family, Lord. We hold her up. Guide her footsteps, Father. And Lord, we take this precious child and we give her to you today in Jesus' name. And we dedicate her as a child of the Most High God. Use Oliver as a Godparent, Lord, as he will guide and direct and speak wisdom into this child's life. I pray for this family, Lord, that each one of them will examine their walk with you. And that we will know, Father, that our life is being watched and that she is that important, God, to help her grow. And Lord, I just declare that the callings in her life, the purpose for her would be fulfilled, O oh God, and she'd be on the journey, Lord, that she will become all. Can you say that with me? All? All that you've designed for her to become even before she was born, Lord, you have a plan. And so, Nyla, today we dedicate you to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are his and he is yours. And we pray that you will live for him. And on that beautiful day when you go to the heavens, you'll see your daddy. And Lord, on this earth, you'll see your mama, and you will grow. So we praise you. We honor you, we bless them, and we cover them by your blessing in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Love you, girl. Glory. Thank you, brother.
Come on, we're going to go right back into worship and praise. Caden, you guys just do what you got to do. Let's worship the Lord. Let's exalt Him.
I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within his presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak. starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus
that song. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is love. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a the outer court to the holy place past the brazen altar Lord I want to see your face pass me by the crowds of people and the priest who sing your praise I hunger and the thirst your righteousness the soul if I found one place take me into the Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me in to the Holy of Holies. Take the cold, cleanse my lips, here I am. Take me past the outposts, to the holy place, past the brazen altar. sing your praise. I hunger and thirst for your righteousness. It's only found on one place. Take me into the holy of holies. Take me in by the light of the Lamb. Take me into the holy of holies. Take the cold and smile
Some people have no idea what this song really refers to. I'm going to try to make this clear. Before we shift or change the order of the service at all, the original tabernacle in the wilderness that God set up, he set an outer court area. And that was a place for cleansing and the sacrifice. And then there was a, a curtain doorway to another section further up, and it was the holy place and in that holy place there was a candle stick on one side a, a table of showbread on the other and an altar of incense and that was a place of of prayer and uh, knowing the Lord a little deeper 
than just from the point of salvation. It was a place that you could go and for them it would be a, a deeper place. And then there was this place called the Holy of Holies. Nobody could ever go there. The, the curtain was sealed. Matter of fact, tradition says that the priest that would go there once a year and cry out to God for the sins of the people, that if he wasn't right, that he could possibly die and they would drag him out with a rope around his foot because that place was so holy and so beautiful. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, they still had that same temple around. But the awesome part was that the outer court still existed in that holy place, but where the giant curtain was, it ripped apart from top to bottom and fell to the ground and exposed the area where you can get closer to God than you've ever been in your life. Many people in the world today, they give their life to Jesus, they stay in the outer court. And the invitation is come a little closer. And so they go to the holy place and the showbread is symbolic of Jesus and the, the prayer, the incense is, is, is a symbolic of the prayers of the saints and, and the candle opera is symbolic of the Holy Spirit and God's word. And so you can get in that place enjoying his word and his presence and praying. But then he says, but I really want you to come a little closer. I want you to come where you can hear my heartbeat where your heart is sold out to me all the way. Those that go to that Holy of Holies, their lives are transformed forever. It's a decision to say, God, I lay everything down and I want to know you deeper than I've ever known you before. So I'm going to give an invitation this morning while we're singing this. If you're here this morning, and you say, Brother David, I want to give my life a little closer to him. I want to lay some things down. There's some things I'm dealing with that I know he wants me to let go. And I'm going to come into that deeper place with him. A place where there's a complete surrender. A place where his presence can overwhelm me and take control of my life. Many people say, I need a Savior. But not everyone says, I want a Lord. The Lord is the one that says, I'll guide your life. So as we sing this a couple more times, if that is you, but you want to give your life to him, just come on, stand across the front. Somebody will pray with you. But just for the next few minutes, come on. This is your time. A time of going a little bit deeper. A time of going a little bit closer. A time of saying, God, I want to surrender everything to you. He's going to sing it. This is your moment. Come on. Just don't get the Spirit of God directing us. Come on, sing it. Come on, just make those decisions. Jesus, this is between you and him. Just go get him. He's here right now to hear your cry, to answer your desire. Jesus, we cry out to you. I make that decision, God, to come, to lay it down, to lay down my life to lay down the sin and the temptations I come to that place with you Jesus 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 breaking the mold of religion entering into the place of deeper relationship Jesus, 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 Jesus. Take me past the outer core. Come on. Come on. If you're not up here, just sing worship and praise. My God, my God, my God. Pass me by the crowds of people and the priests. Jesus. Jesus, 
if you're one of the ministry leaders or you feel you're part of that altar worker team or a leader in the church and you know your heart you want to minister you come on come on come on come on come on come on, come on. I want to share with you real quick I hear the Holy Spirit saying and I don't know if this is for more than one person but you grab a hold of the words if it's for you but I heard the word abandoned and it's not that you're abandoned but he wants you to abandon the pain he wants you to abandon the memory he wants you to abandon yesterday. He wants you to abandon the things that are trying to draw your heart and your mind and walk away from them. So as we're beginning to sing this just a little bit more, if that is you, there's some things that you need to abandon. You lay them down before God and say, I'm abandoning you. I'm never picking you up again. I'm walking the way of Jesus. I'm walking the way of the Holy of Holies. I want to be in his presence. I want to feel his presence more. Let it go. Come on. If that's you, just get a hold of him. Come on. Caleb, help us sing it if you can. Jesus, 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 Jesus. To the holy, holy. Let go of yesterday. Take me by the blood. I speak to the memories and I render you powerless. Come on, come on, come on. Just pray if you're not up here. We'll let go. We'll let go. We abandon it. Jesus, we come a little closer to you, Lord. Jesus, Jesus. I want everybody in this building to close your eyes for just a minute, please. Wherever you're at. I keep hearing the Lord reminding. He's just like speaking to my ear. And I'm sure there's more than one because this is almost a generic statement, but it is for a specific person or persons. He is speaking to my heart saying, I want you to give it to me. I want you to abandon it, give it to me. I'm a big enough God. I can handle it, release it, release it to me. Release it to me, says the Lord. It's causing you pain. It's causing you to be drawn down. And God is saying, give it to me. Don't you know that I was there when it happened? Don't you know that I've been there the whole time, says the Lord? 
I died on the cross. I shed my blood that you can be free. I bore the punishment for you to have peace, says the Lord. So give it to me even now. Give it to me. Give it to me. And trust me. Release it. Abandon it. Just hear him saying, I I bore the stripes on my body. I suffered the nails in my hands and my feet and the crown on my head so that you could get rid of it. I paid the price that you would be free from the pain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Wherever you're at in this building right now, and I know there's some here, but there's some in the congregation and you're not up here. And it's all right. Because God is saying, right where you're at, release it to me right now. Right where you're at, release it to me right now. And trust me. So Lord, we take these circumstances. We take the pain. Maybe you're online, I don't know, but I just sense it so strong. He's saying, abandon it. I hear him saying to somebody this morning, it's like it's a weight holding you back. And you want to go forward, but the weight is holding you down. And he's saying, I want you to abandon that thing. Give it to me. Don't think on it anymore. Don't dwell on it anymore. My God. It's like a heavy weight that won't let go. You take a step forward, but it's just dragging you back. And God is saying, get rid of it. Give it to me. I'll handle the circumstances, but give the stress of it. Give the pain of it. Give the memory of it to me. I paid the price that you would be set free. That's what the Lord is saying to somebody in this building right now. If that is you, give it to him right now. Just say, Jesus, I give that to you. I won't pick it up again. Father, right now, every assignment of the enemy, we call that assignment to be canceled Show Rabba Baha'i, my God, my God, my God. There's somebody in here that you need to forgive somebody. And God is saying, you forgive them, I'll handle them, but you'll be set free. You forgive them, I'll handle them, but you will be set free from the paralyzing power of bitterness and anger that unforgiveness just holds us back if that's you right now just forgive whomever that is say God I release them to you you take care of that thought that situation that memory I forgive them and I move forward Jesus right now come on come on just do it where you're at it's you and Jesus right now you and Jesus Forgive as you've been forgiven, says the Lord. Forgive as you've been forgiven. Forgive as I've forgiven you, says the Lord. My God, my God, my God. Break every weight, every fear, every pain. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Come on, just worship for a couple more minutes. My God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord.
Father, we praise you. Father, we honor your name in this building. And we trust you. We trust you. Jesus. I saw a face a few moments ago, but I believe, and I don't see them in here anymore, but I believe this is for more than one person. But as you release, as you forgive, as you let go, as you abandon those thoughts and memories and things, the Lord says, I will bless you. I will bless you on your journey. I will bless you, says the Lord. I want to bless you, says the Lord. But the weight's got to go. The weight's got to go. And he will bless you, says the Lord. Come on. Come on. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Jesus. team a big hand please come on it's good to have Zach sing with it Caden's got a little bit of throat thing going on but got Zach and others and Jacob that can sing and it's just good to have all of them amen you can be seated this morning um, the nursery is open from age zero to three and the children's church is Sister Tammy meeting in the conference room back here, age 4 to 11. You are welcome to go back there for the children. Amen. Tell somebody next to you, you sure look good. Matter of fact, Caden, don't, where'd you go? We're going to hop back up there, play, let's play something for us. You got something? I'm going to ask everyone to do something real quick. You've been sitting for a little while. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat. Take, we're going to take three minutes. Go find somebody you have not spoken with and make them feel loved and welcome this morning. Come on. you got to get up out of your seat. Come on. Get up out of your seat. Go find somebody. Go find somebody. Go make them feel loved. Come on. Slip around. Slip around. Just slip around. Go tell somebody they look good today. Come on, just go find somebody. If they're sitting down, you go to them. Come on, let everybody feel loved. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. Come on. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Take your time. Love on them. Just love on somebody.
Gina, I was in a church several years ago, and service started at 7, but yet it was like 7, I don't know, 7.20, and I was wondering when they were going to start. And the preacher got up and said, if you're wondering when we started, it started at 7 o'clock. He said, we take the first 30 minutes and just let people fellowship. Come on. Sometimes we need to connect with the others and, and uh, get their story a little bit. Get to know them a little bit. Amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Bless the Lord. Sometimes you guys like herding cats, so <laughs> amen. We are so excited this morning. I do have a word, but we're, we're going to take a moment um, and just see what God does. But uh, how many enjoy Jacob and his uh, love, his ministering? He, he is a part of the worship team, but also does so many other things. And, uh, you know, we've become used to him being here. And it's, it's good to have his mother and his father uh, with us today. Chris and Pilar White. Did I say it right? Amen. And it's good to have you guys. And if you, some of you don't know how long it's been since the stroke. Eight months ago, the, if, if you were here eight months ago, you heard us praying for this man as he had a, uh, a stroke. And um, it was the grace of God that sustained him. And uh, he ministers, they minister to uh, other countries, Pakistan, places like that. Beautiful ministry. And um, they're in visiting Jacob, and they didn't ask me you know, anything of, of coming and sharing anything at all. They just come to visit their son, which I suppose you know, they like him a little bit or something. And um, we get to fellowship with them a little bit. But I asked Chris if he would just share just something with you guys um, before I bring the word. We'll just see what goes on. So, Chris, come on if you would. You want to be down here or up here? Easier down here. Can we get someone to grab this for him? And, uh, that's all right. Here you go. I'm a little shaky on my feet still. It's actually February 5th of this year that I had the stroke. But it was about a month ago that I was asked to speak at a conference at Yale University, Yale Students for Christ. I've been around that campus since my freshman year, 53 years ago, and we had the largest gathering of Christian students and alumni that I've ever seen in modern times on that campus. In the middle of all the darkness in the universities, never forget, as the darkness gets darker, God is moving. We, we filled the largest chapel on that camp with, chap, campus with the worship of the Lord. And I'm going to give you a very shortened version of the message I spoke Sunday morning on that campus. I'm in 2 Corinthians 5. If someone wants to follow along, and no, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. Just a few select verses out of it. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It was a year ago this past August that we had our largest outreach yet in Pakistan. 4,000 Muslim villagers came to a field where I preached via Skype, and that day 3,300 became believers in Jesus. We were supposed to travel there in February, February 16th, but February 5th I had a stroke so we couldn't travel. And in God's sense of humor, he put a nurse in my room who was from Lahore, Pakistan, where we were supposed to be. And she said to me, thank God you were not there when you had the stroke because there's no medical facility. Thank God you were here. That was the mercy of God. This was a Muslim nurse telling me that was the mercy of God, that you had your stroke here. Well, the Lord spared my life as a dear medical friend who called me a month ago said, Chris, you should be dead paralyzed, blind, deaf, or all of the above. Instead, you're walking, talking, and serving the Lord. Now, why am I alive? Well, when all the blood flow from here was cut off by a blockage from below, 
because of an attempt when someone tried to kill me when I was eight years old by smashing my head into a sidewalk. That's another story. I won't go into all of it. But it caused damage in my spine, in my blood vessels up here that resulted in that stroke in February of this year. But when the stroke happened and everything below stopped in the blood flow, the Lord had provided a prenatal artery that should have passed away 69 years earlier. Prenatal arteries can flow both ways. Adult vessels only flow one way. Children are more flexible than adults. That's the message here. Well, when everything stopped here, the prenatal blood flow, which was connected to the um, carotid artery, brought the blood down from above. And that's why I'm alive. It was actually a neurologist at Yale New Haven Hospital who discovered that. And he said, I have never seen this in my life. Everyone in that hospital said to me, you're a walking miracle. God is not done. <laughs> in fact, it was three weeks before the stroke that the pastor of my church, who prophesied the open door three years earlier to Pakistan, prophesied the Lord has even larger doors ahead from you. Well, within three weeks of that prophecy, I was flat on my back in the hospital. But I knew God wasn't done. And I'm here. We have an earthly house, but it is not our final house. Thank you, Lord. If you had bad knees, bad backs, all of that's going to pass away. This is for a little while. It's our place to live and serve for the Lord. But we will be with him forever. And that's why verse 9 of the same chapter appears. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present, meaning here, or absent, meaning with the Lord, to be well-pleasing to him. It's not about pleasing ourselves. It's about pleasing the one who is our life. For you must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in this body. Our bodies are a gift for a little while. They're going to pass away. They're a house for us to live in to serve the Lord, not to live for ourselves, but to live for him. That each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I've learned a lot more about that passage this year, about the fear and the terror of the Lord. When you're that close to death, you know how good God is. But the Lord gave me grace to minister to the doctors when I went through that. The last verse I'm going to speak on from this passage is verse 20. And this is not just about evangelists and pastors. This is about everyone in this room who knows Jesus. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. You are an ambassador in your office, in your home, with your babies, with your children, with your wives, with your husbands, with your town, with your neighbors. You are an ambassador. As though God were pleading through us. Now, when God called me to be an evangelist, I said what Moses said, Lord, find somebody else. I can't preach. I fought with the Lord for quite a while, but don't do that. You lose. Either way, I lost, and I am so happy because life is much richer when you obey the Lord. We implore you on Christ's behalf. We are representing him. Salvation is not about me. It's not about you. It's not our work. It's his. He's the healer. He's the redeemer. He's the convictor of sin. He's the one who can argue with the atheist better than you or I. We are ambassadors to bring them the truth. For he made him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us, the one who knew no sin. Jesus was made a sin offering on the cross. Everything of the evil of this world was on him, child abuse, rape, murder, war. He bore it all, and no wonder he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That, to me, is the hardest thing about the cross. When Jesus died on that cross, the Father had to turn away for a moment from his own son. When Jesus gave his life to pay the price of sin forever and then received his son back from the dead, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Me and you, the righteousness of God, that's what we are called to. We are called to be clothed in Jesus Christ, not in anything that comes from ourselves, but from his power. I mentioned before that prophecy the pastor had. In September, the ministers and churches in Pakistan put together an outreach for us. September 23rd, they got a soccer field 
there was a terrible rainstorm four hours before and that entire field was flooded. If you can imagine pastors and volunteers drying a soccer field in the matter of two or three hours. When they got the field dry, we didn't have 4,000 Muslims in that field. September 23rd, we had 17 and a half thousand Muslims. And by the end of that time, 13,200 received the Lord. And there were over a thousand who were healed. And there's a point I want to make about that as I close. It's not about our strength. I can't speak, but Jesus can speak through me. You may think that you cannot minister, but God wants to minister through you. He doesn't call us according to our strengths. He calls us according to our weaknesses. Dwight Moody, the greatest American evangelist of the 19th century, could not put two sentences together. But God called him and transformed him so that people in New York City would listen to him preach for five hours. And no one left those places where he spoke. It's not about us. God makes able the unable. He gives power to the weak. It's his work. And every one of you in this room has a calling on your life. They're not all the same calling, but there are things God wants to do through you that he can't do through anyone else. Every one of us is called to be a member of the body of Christ. His hands his feet, his nose, his ears, his eyes. You have a place in the kingdom of heaven and there are people who are dying who need you to surrender all to Jesus so he can manifest his power in you. Amen. Hallelujah. I could let him just keep on speaking, guys. I mean, it's powerful stuff, Chris. Praise the Lord. I don't do this very often. I do this when I'm told to. So the Holy Spirit said take an offering for your ministry. So, um, you know, we had, a, we had a minister come in here the other day um, in, on our Wednesday, uh, uh, Sunday night revival service. By the way, we do have revival service tonight. And the, I was standing up here, and the guy came. He was a, a visiting uh, evangelist from India. And I said, Lord, am I supposed to take an offering? And, and the Lord said, no. It's okay. But this morning, I feel like God is saying to me, we need to bless this ministry. Come on. You know, this, this, is, where, this is where it steps into another level. You see, we've already taken an offering for the church. So if you've given, then you've given what you can give. But then when you step out and say, okay, God, I'm going to step to another level in giving. Because, see, this offering will cost you a little more. The other offering is what you could handle, but now we're beyond that. So I just feel in my spirit, Chris, if you guys don't mind, that we're supposed to just bless your ministry, whether it's Pakistan or whether it's, you know, gas, whatever. I don't care. But we give it into the kingdom. Uh, you graduated Yale? Yale and, Yale and Columbia. And he's been ministering for many, many, many years. And we had a good conversation yesterday about... Um, people trying to get titles he said basically the titles should be just what we do <laughs> that's the, should be the description of what we're already doing okay in other words don't we don't get a title so someone will see us as something we're doing that already and the title is just the description of who we are we had a real good conversation of the, some of the battles you go through in your body you know physical things hit you and you know why you know why is it when god wants to bring you to another level your body's going through some junk to get there we don't have answers, but we know that the Lord carries us through. So we had a great lunch conversation yesterday and uh, enjoyed it. But their ministry, and if you remember Jacob, I think probably several months ago, said we need Bibles in Pakistan and things like that um, for what God is doing. And they're faithful ministers. And I just heard the Holy Spirit say, take an offering for them. And so um, we got a basket up here. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah. If you have a check, make it out to World Outreach. We're going to give them one check. But the baskets are up here. So please just come and let God bless you with it. You can give through Give the Fi. If you do Give the Fi, please put a note on there, on the memo, that this is for uh, the white ministry. Or is there a name? Of you? It's the Fresh Springs Christian Church. 
fresh, fresh springs association. Amen. Okay. Pastor Marcus, come up and count it, would you, real quick? Hey, we're going to put us on the spot. He's counting souls, man. He's just, he's just talking about over 20,000 people come to Christ. And that, that's crazy. 20,000 people get saved. Amen. Come on. You got to understand, this is with a big screen video quite often. Am I right, Chris? You guys have a big screen out there? So a screen the size of the, the soccer field, and you're speaking from... But you're, you're speaking from your, his living room, and thousands are getting saved. Don't you know that's the anointing of God? Come on. It's powerful. So um, we just want to bless this ministry. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's it. I'm just, I'm just doing what I feel in my spirit I'm supposed to do, guys. So the Lord bless it in Jesus' name. And, um, yeah, hallelujah. You doing all right? I think he does it on purpose. When they count the money, him and my daughter both, they stay up there a long time so people will start, you know, come give some more. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. There you go. See, that's how that works. It's, just, it's, just a, it's a system they've got. I'm not really sure. <laughs> oh, my, 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 my. Hallelujah. We had kind of an impromptu thing, but we sure could have just let him share. Amen. Hallelujah. You done yet, brother? How much? $763. Come on. Does anybody want to make it eight? Oh, here we go. $773. How, how, oh, well, then we're there. Okay, then we got to be there. That's just hers. Yeah. Okay. Hey, we're a little over $800. Come on, give Jesus a shout of praise. You guys are awesome. Every time the Lord has us do that, he blesses. So bless you guys. Just leave it in a basket and let, we'll give it to Tammy and she can make a check out. So just take it with you over there. That way it'll. Okay. Amen. Thank you. We're not keeping it. We'll give it to you. <laughs> it is a good thing when God does it. You know, when God says do it, you do it, and he does what he wants to do. I don't know what their need is, or even if there is a need, but I just know we have a God that is faithful. Yes. Come on. Give Jesus one more shout of praise. Thank you for your obedience to the Lord. I'm going to share just briefly with you this morning, not much, because, you know, I, like I said, I could have just ate up what he just shared, and uh, I, I wish we just didn't even think ahead. Just, I got to think in the middle last night late. I said, well, man, Chris is going to be there tomorrow. We should let him share a little bit. And then Marcus said, you going to let him share a little bit? I said, so I put him on the spot. But open your Bible, if you would, to the book of uh, Mark, if you would, chapter uh, 5. Mark chapter 5. I've just got a short passage here to share with you as we prepare to go home. Remember service tonight, revival service. Uh, it's at 7 o'clock. We've been having some incredible times with the Lord uh, he has been moving beautifully, and uh, we, we don't go without, uh, without being blessed. Amen? Here we go. Chapter 5, verse 22, the book of Mark. And behold, there came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. So would you come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed? 
that she will live. What a wonderful blessing. He knows the answers around the corner. He knows the answers there in the person of Jesus. He, he saw the other miracles. He heard the rumors. He, you know, people talk when miracles start happening, and he has an opportunity. His little girl is dying, and he says, I'm going to go to Jesus and ask for help. And he does, and Jesus says, yeah, I'll come and lay hands on her. And Jesus went with him, verse 24, and much people followed him and thronged him, meaning there's a big crowd pushing on him, touching him. And there was a certain woman which had an issue of blood for 12 years. And she suffered many things of physicians, and she had spent all of her money, but didn't get any better, but rather got worse. And in that day, and this is a side note, um, a woman that, that was bleeding like that was considered unclean by that world, the culture they lived in. And it was almost illegal for her to come out of the house and get in public. But yet she made a decision. She says, I know the healer is near. Come on. I know the healer is near. So she made the decision. I'm going to the healer, and I'm going to do what I got to do to get a hold of him. Now Listen. And when she heard Jesus came the, with the press behind, she, she pressed in behind him and she touched his garment. And you have to understand this. And again, this isn't the message. It's kind of a sideline. If she'd been bleeding for 12 years, she was probably very weak. I assume she'd be frail. I assume she, she couldn't make it. You know, her body was really given out on her. And the crowd was thick. And I'm going to say this. When you're near the miracle worker, it's like being near the billionaire. Nobody wants to let you get closer than you are. But she had to fight her way through. And my opinion is, I don't know, this is just viewpoint. I think the best way to get there sometimes is to crawl lower than standing up taller. So she's kind of going through the legs and whatever she can do. And she reaches out and she grabs the hem of his garment. Now there's some teachings on the priesthood and things like that. And we can go there, but we're not going to. She, by faith, said, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And straightway the fountain of her blood dried up, and she felt her body that she was healed of the plague. Verse 30, and Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about and looked at the press and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said, do you see the multitude? They're all touching you. He said, who touched me? He looked around to see her that had done this thing. Verse 33, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done to her, came and she fell down, pretty much confessing, I'm the one that did it, told the truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace and be healed of the plague. The pursuit of God sometimes is a tough journey. Come on, we've all been there. And sometimes it's hard, but you just gotta focus and pursue. But now that's not my message. <laughs> the next couple of verses are while he yet spake, say that with me, while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house a servant that said, Don't bother with him anymore. Your daughter's dead. It's too late. He didn't make it in time. And what I began to think about when I read that is how impatient we are when it comes to God intervening. (laughs) Anybody with me? Because in today's society, you might have said to the woman, wait your turn, he's taking care of me. Come on. I've got his attention right now. This is about me and my need, so you can stay over there. I'm sorry you've been suffering for 12 years, but my daughter is dying. Do you understand? Her situation is more grave than yours. You might make it a little while longer, so stay away because I need him here. Could you imagine what he's doing when, she, when he stops? Now, I can only go with how I am because when I have a need, I have a need. Many years ago, I went to my father-in-law's house. This was when I worked in the grocery business. I had a flat tire. I'll never forget this. Skinny was crazy. I'm in panic mode. I'm literally, I'm late for work. I'm in panic mode. And so I go in and say, man, can you help me? My tire's flat. Yeah, 
I sure can. He was eating in slow motion, I think. His bacon, his eggs, his sausage, his toast, and drinking his coffee and talking slow. And I'm saying, hurry up, hurry up. Gobble it down and come on. He didn't get in a rush at all for me. After he was done, pulled his belt up like you do, stood up, wiped his mouth off, walked out real slowly and helped me with it. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, Jesus, help this guy get, you know, he don't even care. He did care. He actually was old enough to realize it won't fall apart. Just enjoy the meal. Slow down a little bit. Don't freak out. It's going to be all right. But we get in that mode of, man, it's got to be done right now. And you see, Jairus' daughter was in the midst of death. Tell me a greater need than that. And so he comes to Jesus, and he is a, a man of authority. But he bows down. He's humbled himself. He's broken. Please, my daughter is about to die. One of the versions says she's already dead. That's how close she was. And Jesus says, okay. Can you imagine? I got him. We're coming. We're coming. The crowd's slowing us down, but we're going to make it. God, don't let her die till we get there. We're going to make it. And then he stops and said, who touched me? And you're saying, what are you doing? You got someplace else to be. It's to take care of my need. And yet you're dealing with her. And Jesus wasn't in a hurry. He said, who touched me? The disciples said, everybody touched you. The whole crowd's around here. They touched you. Everybody did. He said, no, somebody touched me because virtue left my body. Something happened. Somebody got healed. Somebody touched me with faith. And the whole time, Jairus is probably biting his fingernails saying, but I can't say nothing because this guy's got the stuff. You know what I'm saying? Bakers can't be choosy. <laughs> and I'm in trouble and I need him, so I've got to be patient and wait on him. And the beauty thing of it is he was never interrupted because he was walking in the timeline and the plan of the creator of the universe. You see, we see it as interruption. He says, it's just part of the plan. You didn't think I knew she was coming? Why you think I came this way so she could catch up and get her healing? Jairus, don't worry about it. It's all right. Just believe, because I'm still God. I'm still involved. I told you I'd come, but it's in my timeline. I mean, hey, Jesus, the guy you love, Lazarus, the one you love, the dude's sick. Jesus, okay, I'm coming. Let's wait a few days till he dies. Doesn't even make any sense to us, but God's timing is God's timing. If we can just slow down and say, I don't understand it. I don't even like it. But I know you're moving and you're working on my behalf. I know you're making your way to that place where the miracle's about to happen. Come on. Verse 35. While he yet spake, there came a ruler of the synagogue's house. Said, your daughter's dead. Don't bother him any further. As soon as the negative word came, Jesus heard the word. He said to the ruler, don't be afraid. Only believe. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Why do he say that? Because in his eyes and in the natural realm, all hope is gone. What am I going to do? I can't even get there. This is an absolute disaster. But God said, I am for you. And if I'm for you, who can be against you? You cannot lose. No weapon formed against you can prosper. That's your heritage. You are my daughter. You're my son. You're my child. I am with you. If you die, you're with me. If you live, you're with me. But I am with you always. So then Jesus says, we're going to have to clear the air a little bit, though. I don't want anybody else coming with me. He said, Peter, James, John, you guys come on. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and there's a group there wailing and crying because death had taken over. Let me tell you, when death takes over, there's life that comes in. It says it does not win because I'm the one that died and rose again, and I defeated death, hell, and the grave. Come on, somebody. 
It can look grim. It can look impossible. It can look like I'm not going to survive this. It can look like, man, I need you there right now. And I know some of you going through this, I didn't prepare this because of that. Many in our house have gone through so many things in the last few months. But God is saying, I'm still there. And it's in the timing of my hand. Just believe. Only believe. Isn't it amazing that he used that word that way? Be not afraid. Only believe. Don't add nothing else into it. I just believe. Come on. He told everybody, go. He comes in, this great tumult of people crying and wailing and negative. It's all, it's over, it's too late. And when he came in, he said to them, why are you making this big ado and crying? The damsel's not dead. She's just sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn, and he put them all out, except the father and the mother and the damsel and he went to the room where the child was laying. Can I tell you something? She was not sleeping. She was dead. She was bona fide dead to the natural realm. But to the kingdom of God, the impossible is possible. In the kingdom of God, a virgin can have a baby because God said it so. Do you understand? In the kingdom of God, you can walk on water. In the kingdom of God, the storm will steal. In the kingdom of God, you can say, I need money to pay taxes. And a fish will come and bite your hook and have money in its mouth for you. In the kingdom of God, there cannot be enough. Just a few fish and some loaves. But God says, my kingdom trumps the natural kingdom. She's not dead. She's just asleep. Because that's how I see it. He took the girl by the hand. He said, Talitha Kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say to thee, arise. There was no shouting, no banging on drums, no music, no laying on the floor, no intercession, no crying out. He came in with authority because he knew the timing of the Father was working. I say unto thee, arise, and straightway, at once, at that very second, because God said it, the damsel rose up and started walking. She was 12 years old. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. I guess so. Every time God has done something for me, I've had great astonishment. Even when I've doubted him and I get to the other end, and I say, wow, you did it again. The journey's hard. The fear, the worry, the girl's dead. It's too late. Don't bother him. It's never too late with the God we serve. And I love this part. He charged him straightway, don't tell anybody about this, that didn't work. And then he said, oh, um, she's hungry, would you give her something to eat? He just raised her from the dead and he's worried about her eating some lunch. Doesn't that tell you how much he loves you? That he may do a miracle, but he's still concerned about the smallest details of our life. Oh, what a savior. Chris was talking to me about on the journey of his ministry. Is it all right? We, you know, we, I'm sure it is. Of, of you know, the timing of his stroke and the timing of malaria and other things. He says it seems like when God wanted to do something great, he said, my body went under some form of attack, and he's trying to figure out, you know, what part of it is God using for his glory and what part of it is just something that happened. I, and, I, you know, I said, I think he's going to use it all for his glory. But it's tough on the journey. But I serve a faithful God. All the years of serving him, I have seen him do the miraculous. 
whether it's just peace in the midst of a room where there was pain and sorrow, or whether it's a miracle of healing or a supernatural provision, or him intervening, fixing a marriage when it was hopeless. Come on. I got to tell you that story. I'll be done in a minute. Actually, you'll get out early, so that's better. We had a family in our church. I don't know why I'm sharing this. We had a family in our church. They actually ran our children's ministry. And something happened in their marriage. And this may seem like a sideline, but it's still talking about the timing and the miraculous of God. And he had never been married before, married her. She had three children, loved the Lord, great people, givers in the kingdom, standing for the Lord. And I'll never forget, I think it was a Sunday morning, she came in and her face was like a brick wall. It was like, Jesus, she's, she's dead. And I tried to speak with her and she was shut off. She was so cold. He came to me and said, I don't know what to do. Her best friend tried to counsel with her, didn't do no good. He's on the couch, she's in the room. The kids are confused because it looks like they're headed for a divorce. It's bad. Things were going on in her life that probably shouldn't have been going on. And he said, what do I do, Pastor David? I was young then, a lot younger than I am now. I don't have answers for those kind of things. So I said, the only thing I know you can do. He said, you have a key to this church. You're one of the leaders. I said, why don't you come here every single night? Don't come in and pray for her. Just come in here and get a hold of God. Seek his face. Said, That's what I suggest you do. Run to him. Isn't that what we just read? Run to him. So he's doing that. She goes out of town on some business trips and only God knows what went on those trips, but you know what he was doing? Fasting. Pursuing the Lord. I'll never forget some of the, the children she had were teenage kids, and they came in and said, what happened to him? I said, why? They said, he's changing. He's not the same person he was before. He's doing things he's never done before. He wasn't doing it to woo his wife. He was doing it to touch heaven. And when heaven touches you, everything shifts. I don't know who this is for. I'm just telling you some facts. Week after week, he's praying. I'll never forget in all the years of ministry. Actually, they were in ministry. Listen to this. This is blow some theological thought processes of doctrine. In the religious world, they'd say, get them out of the ministry because they're not living up to par. You know, they're a bad example or maybe they got a bad spirit on them and it might get on our kids, so get them out. I said, Holy Spirit, what do I do? He said, leave them in. He said, the ministry is their lifeline. That's their lifeline. I said, okay. I spoke to the leaders and they said, okay. I'll never forget the Sunday morning, Robert. Never forget it. She walked around the corner. We were in this little brick building. She walked around the corner, and she came through them double doors, and she had a big smile on her face. And I called her by name, and I said, what happened? She says, I quit my job, and I'm going to be a wife to my husband. God's restored our marriage. Come on. This is 30 years ago, probably. They're still together. That's the power of our God. But his timing is vital. It's a journey. He told Abraham, you're going to have a promised child. But Abraham got tired of waiting. <laughs> Made one on his own. <laughs> God said, that's going to be a big mess for the future. <laughs> and it is. But the promised child still came in God's timing. Why did Jesus come when he did? Because he had to have certain priests in place that would crucify him. 
God's timing. Had to fulfill prophecies of old out of the book of Daniel and so forth and so on. It's his timing. He is God. So if you're going through it and you belong to him, grab a hold of him and say, I trust your timing. You've got me. You've got me. Don't let impatience kill our faith. No matter how tough it is. I'll speak personal for a minute and I'll close in prayer. Sister Tammy and I made a decision to step out in the ministry and shut down all other source of income except for how God provides. And we've been challenged. We've been challenged. Every day we got to say, we trust you for today. We trust you for today. So we're still givers. We love to give. So we got a phone call the other day and someone said, we need, we need to buy some stuff for a family that's in trouble. And so I looked at Tammy and I said, well, she said, I found a refrigerator for $300. I said, okay, let's, let's just get money that we can't afford and give the $300. You with me? Later that week, someone comes up to me and gives me $300. We gave another fundraiser we couldn't afford, so we gave a fundraiser $100 to help somebody. That afternoon or the next morning, we got a Venmo thing, $100 into the account this week. My God. I opened my briefcase this morning. I have a hard drive that I was trying to get for the baby dedication so I could look up some stuff. Couldn't find it. It was in my computer case. I pulled it out. Skinny, there was two $100 bills in there. The timing of God, it's hard to be patient. It's hard. But the Bible says, let patience have her perfect work in you. And it will bring you to full maturity in Christ. That's what it says. I didn't write it. Our patience is in the waiting for his timing. It's not easy, but he's faithful. Father, we come before you. Thank you for blessing my brother and my sister this morning with this offering. Thank you, Lord, for the word he gave. I ask you, God, to continue to bless them. I thank you for this simple little word. And I pray, God, help me. I can pray for others, God. But help me to continue to have patience with your timing. Lord, when they came to Jairus and they said, it's too late. All his hope was probably dashed, and Jesus said, just believe. That's all I ask you to do, only believe. Help us to only believe. We will make it to the other side because you sent us there. And you are not a man that you can lie. Your promises are yea and amen. We honor you. We praise you. Lord, and for that marriage story, I don't know who that was for. But God, I ask you that that family, whoever they are, would grab a hold of you and seek you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And watch what you can do with relationships. Because that's just who you are. 
You said, seek you first, your kingdom and your righteousness, and all that we need will be added to us. We honor you this morning, and we praise you. Bless each one. As we go to our homes, Lord, let us seek you to trust. Bless the service tonight, Lord. Let the name that is above all names be glorified. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. amen. Can we give the Lord one more hand, if you don't mind? Please do me a favor, if you would, before you leave. Speak to a few people. Shake their hands, hug their neck, get to know them. Don't just run out. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you soon.